talk with you in it if you don't mind. I promise I won't be long. If you pray, I'll, I'll be short even. <laughs> Amen. Uh, our sister congregation, Trinity, had a wedding rehearsal yesterday. And it was a nice young couple, real sweet, and they're ready to start the journey together, you know. And those of you all who can remember that day, you probably remember all the nervous and everything. And think about this for a moment. We have a wedding rehearsal. And then we just take that young couple and throw them into the fire of matrimony. I know some people claim that, well, you know, that's why we live together before. And no, that's not a marriage rehearsal. Marriage rehearsal is not about living in the same house. Marriage rehearsal is about how two people interact who have been accustomed to not looking beyond the point of their nose, and now they've got to look at somebody else. See, we need to be practicing that. In fact, we don't, we don't need to wait until we get a girlfriend to practice that, fellas. Uh, tell your grandson and your nephew, he needs to be practicing that from the time he gets in kindergarten, how to look beyond the end of his nose and see that there is a neighbor out there. Amen. See, there's a lot of ways that God puts us together. And so today I'm going to talk to you about what God has joined together. And like I said, if y'all pray with me, I won't talk long. But a generation ago, Dr. F.B. Meyer said this about the local church. It is urgently needful that the Christian people of our charge should come to understand that they are not a company of invalids to be wheeled about or fed by hand, cosseted, nursed, and comforted, the minister being the head physician and nurse, but a garrison in an enemy's country, every soldier of which should have some post or duty at which he should be prepared to make any sacrifice rather than quitting. How many of you all know that we are not on the love boat in the body of Christ? Amen. Amen. Bow your heads with me and let's pray a little bit. Lord God, Almighty Father, you have called your church to witness that in Christ you have reconciled us to yourself. Grant that by your Holy Spirit, we may proclaim the good news of your salvation so that all who hear it may receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now it would help us, saints, if we first recognize that in this passage, our gospel text, our Lord Jesus was not talking to the disciples. Mm -mm. They were listening in on a conversation, conversation between him and his father concerning the disciples. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, his first petition is a request that the Father would glorify the Son. Jesus further elaborates in verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And there's nothing wrong or selfish with praying for yourself. Kenneth Blanchard, the author of The One Minute Manager, is quoted as saying, if you don't blow your own horn, someone else will use it as a spittoon. The Lord's Prayer consists primarily of petitions for ourselves, for needs, for forgiveness, for direction. Jesus always did the things that pleased the Father. Therefore, this prayer was in God's will. Notice, Jesus' petition had a divine purpose attached, that the Son may glorify you. Jesus knew the difference between asking for something selfishly while claiming it was for God's glory and praying for something to be accomplished in his life 
to the glory of God. You know, when I was a young man, that was a while ago, I know. But then, then I went through this period when the end thing was for every uh, so-called prophetess to prophesy over every young man that was single that he was going to get this fine, green-eyed, blonde-haired girl. Now, first of all, there was a lot of pretty women at the church that did not have green hair, I mean, green eyes and blonde hair. I know you can find some green-haired women nowadays. And sometimes I used to wonder, did, did these so-called prophets have some sort of contract with the uh, the uh, eye doctors in the area? Because as soon as that happened, there would be an upsurge in girls going out to buy green contact lenses. But we would sit there and pray for stuff like this, say, oh, Lord, if you do this for me, you know, I'll tell all the world how you blessed me. Another big one was this, this thing about, you know, uh, claiming stuff. You know, they would quote this, oh, the wicked lay in store for the righteous. Well, you know what? I don't know how wicked Elon Musk is, but if you've been trying to get his money by asking God to co-sign that check, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. See, for example, the Bible tells us that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Therefore, our prayers to gain vengeance on our enemies or for their embarrassment or that their goods will be turned over to us for our pleasure, while understandable, are not prayers that God is obligated by either promise or precept to answer affirmatively. So I'm sorry. Your wife is beautiful and be thankful for her. And don't be looking at nobody else talking about, oh, Lord, if you just let me get an upgrade. That is not one of his promises to you. In fact, most of us ought to be glad that the woman we with said yes to us. Because she probably could have done better. But God put that love in our heart for you, man of God. And Lord, I thank you for these wonderful women of God that are sitting next to their husband, looking all lovey-dovey and everything. Gives me something to shoot for, you know. Cause I'm, you know, me and Lenita have only been 10 years. We're the babies of the bunch around here. But it's been good 10 years. Amen to Jesus. And God did bless me. But he didn't bless me because I wanted that fine young lady from Long Beach. He blessed me because he knew what I needed for the work I was about to do. And I couldn't do it, just me and my son, D2. So he knew what I needed. And he knows what you need. And Jesus knew what we needed when he prayed this prayer. But like I said, there are some things you can pray all you want to. And God is not obligated to say yes just because you said in Jesus' name. So as James wrote in James 4, 2, and 3, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And God is not going to cash a check that you wrote from fleshly desires. At best, he'll ignore it, and you'll praise God for it later. And at worst, he'll chasten your covetousness and lust by letting you have it to your ultimate sorrow and shame. And a few saints have learned that too. Don't worry, you don't have to raise your hands. But when you pray with the kingdom of God as your focus, as the fuel that fires your petitions, such a prayer pleases God, for it is truly prayed in Christ's name, that is, under his influence and with his authority. Jesus continued, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Now Jesus completely understood the Missio Dei, 
the mission of God. He understood the will of God and the mind of God, for he is God with us. Amen. And so therefore, he perfectly fulfilled what God sent him to do. What the disciples now know about God, they know because Jesus, the Logos, the word of God, which took flesh and dwelled among us, revealed it to them, telling them that they would in turn teach it to the assembly of those whom God had called together to be his people. In case you're wondering, that's you. The church. And we continue to confess what was witnessed by the apostles and received by the church since the beginning. And yes, saints, it is an old message, over 2,000 years to be exact, but like the mercies of God, it's fresh every morning. As we find new ways to apply God's exceeding great and precious promises, new ways for God's law to protect us from the things that would cause us to stumble or bring us into the bondage of the will, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Oh, and speaking of the devil, Proverbs 16 and 17 says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now, saints, it's going to take some time because your enemies, starting with the devil, don't go away quietly. That roaring lion looks at you, and even though he's in the midst of a dry place, and even though there's a burning lake waiting for him, and he knows it, still you look like a juicy morsel for him today. You know, Peter was part of the group that heard Jesus pray that night. He was the one who stood in Jerusalem and witnessed to the crowd of worshipers that this Jesus, whom you crucified, is both Lord and Christ. He had no idea how they would respond whether they would hear or whether they would refuse. But he was faithful to tell them what he knew, what he had seen and heard for himself. And in so doing, he gave us an example. Now on that day, Peter saw a harvest of 5,000 men for the kingdom, an amazing event. And one that we here at Good Shepherd would love to see in our day. And then a few days later, he did it again. Now this time, the reaction was slightly different, according to Acts 4, 3 and 4. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Yeah, another large harvest, but this time it came with an arrest warrant. Now saints, sooner or later, the devil is going to push back against you as he tries to hold on to his kingdom for a little while longer. And so the apostle Peter gave us these words of instruction. First Peter five and eight, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now those words are in God's word to let you know that God is not surprised and as you're a good shepherd, he wants you to know what you're up against so that you won't be thrown off guard. God wants you to know the nature of your adversary. King Frederick, the great king of Prussia, won a strategic battle with comparative ease and little loss of men. And when asked for the explanation of his victory over the enemy, he said, well, the enemy had seven cooks and one spy, but I have seven spies and one cook. Now, sometimes we act as if the church exists solely for our comfort. We look to the church to supply our creature comforts, forgetting that the church exists not as a cruise ship. Somebody tell your neighbor, say, this ain't the love boat. Oh no, you heard what your neighbor just said to you, right? The ship of Zion is a man of war. It's a ship that's equipped and prepared for battle, amen? Now, a bunch of cooks is nice, but when you're facing your enemies, you need a full situation report more than you need a full plate. We can get dinner after the victory is won. Right now, the battle is on. And Bible study isn't to make you full and satisfied. 
2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man and woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And you're not dressed in the whole armor of God to look cute. You want that? Go get some givant. But the whole armor of God, God gave you that, that equipping through his word for a divine purpose. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13 tells us, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Y'all know that song, Stand Up for Jesus, right? Yes. He wants you to stand. He's equipped you to stand. Not just up for Jesus, holding the John 3.16 sign at the football game, but he wants you to stand with your neighbor. Stand when your neighbor is being attacked by the enemy. Stand when your neighbor is being told that there is no help for him in God. And you are the witness that God is able, that he is more than able, that he is exceedingly and abundantly able. Somebody give God a praise today. Now, have we done all by showing up on Sunday to receive as promised the forgiveness of sins through the preaching of the gospel in word and sacrament? I mean, if our entire testimony of God's grace falls on the lines of we fall down, but we get up. For a saint is just a sinner who fell down and got up. I know I messed up, you know, Donnie's song, but, and I like the song, but if that's all we've got to say about our Lord, we're not lying. We're not living either. God says in the face of the world, the flesh and the devil in Romans 8 verses 35 through 37, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, or persecution? Famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Jesus knew that the time of his service as their teacher and helper was coming to an end. He was about to be lifted up to take away the sin of the world. And in that sense, he is coming out of the world. So he makes a request concerning these men. Verse 11, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. You know, people like to argue, you know, your neighbors that you you talk to them about coming with you. You're the good shepherd. And they come back to you with, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian or to be a good person or to be saved. Now, however they express it, they're missing the point. And if you let them off the hook with that, you ride with them. <laughs> Jesus prayed that his disciples would be one even as he and the Father and the Holy Spirit, according to Matthew 28, 19, are one. The Christians in Jerusalem on and after the day of Pentecost expressed that unity, not only in philosophical terms, but in time and space. They gathered together for prayer, worship, and fellowship. They encouraged one another, not begrudgingly or out of necessity, but in love for one another, and above all, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when our teams, you Red Wing fans and Tiger fans and Lions fans, and oh yeah, you Piston fans too. When y'all, when those teams go out on the field or on the ice or on the court, it's not just a few that show up. 
everybody, the starters, the reserves, the first string to the water boys, bat boys, ball boys and girls, they all are wearing that uniform. They all identify. And y'all sit in the stands and vicariously identify with them. But just like being on the team is more than wearing a jersey, and baptism is more than a ritual that identifies you as being on the Lord's side, being a part of the body of Christ is more than something you do for an hour on Sunday. God forgives us daily. The devil attacks you daily. And people need us to be his witnesses daily. Jesus prayed for us. God gave him what he asked for. And Jesus gave us what we need to make sure that God's yes did not come short because we were the weakest link. And yes, we are. He made sure that we would be able to walk in the good works that he prepared for us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So we've got nothing to fear. God said yes to Jesus' prayer. We don't need to fear failure. We don't need to fear the flesh. We don't need to feel, fear the devil or anything else as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So every day we should get up with a song of praise in our lips and a reminder to Satan himself that he is risen. Say it with me. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The devil has nothing going for him. We've got everything because we've got God on our side. The devil has nothing to look to. We have everything to look to because we have his exceeding great and precious promises. The devil's got nothing in his tank and we have all things and more than enough, enough to share with our neighbor, that very person who needs what we've got. And God's got it for him. Because his mercies are what? New every morning. It's going to be new tomorrow when you get up. It's going to be new on Wednesday in the middle of the week. It's going to be new next Saturday when you feel like your tent is empty. And it's going to be new next Sunday morning when you come back here, look at your neighbors and friends and fellow saints and say how good and pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity because he is our savior, amen? He is the prince of peace, amen? He is the one that has given us everything because he loves us. And so let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen and amen.